Carl Snyder is a multiple time world and Olympic champion in freestyle wrestling, and one department where he clearly stands out from the rest of the competition is strength. He is incredibly strong. He approaches his strength training in a very fundamental and systematic way. No bouncy balls, no weird mazes or special machines, just good old battle-tested, scientifically proven strength training with the classic compound lifts. And generally his strength training is composed of very little volume but very high intensity. We're talking about one to two repetitions per set. And to some extent this is a reflection of his wrestling style as well. He is not the in-your-face kind of wrestler from start to finish, but he's the kind that paces himself and attacks at selected moments. Now before we can analyze his routine we need to know the mastermind behind it. And after some detective work I found out that Neil Serafinas is his strength training coach. Neil was a high school discus thrower and a shot putter at a high level and we know everything about those track and field throwers, how incredibly strong and athletic they are, so he probably knows a thing or two about strength and power training. In this post, Neil argues that being strong is a big deal in wrestling, yet a lot of wrestling coaches focus too much on endurance instead of getting stronger. And this is a fair point and I absolutely agree. As a wrestler it is much better to prioritize strength and power qualities over endurance when it comes to strength and conditioning. And there are several reasons for this. Number one, endurance is developed very fast and lost relatively slowly. Strength on the other hand is developed slowly and lost fast. The act of wrestling by itself is already a high intensity endurance workout and you will get a long way by wrestling alone. Strength and power on the other hand, although they are also emphasized, they are not emphasized to the same extent as conditioning and there is a much higher margin of improvement by doing it in the lifting room. And one underrated point is that strength indirectly leads to a higher endurance. How so, you may ask? Because if you are significantly stronger than your opponent in all major movement patterns, let's say hypothetically two times stronger in everything, then anything that your opponent does will fall significantly below your ceiling of strength and it will not fatigue you as much. It is almost as if you are wrestling a toddler. Very evidently, Mr. Serafina seems to be a big proponent of low repetition strength training, often sticking to one or two reps at top. He argues that anything above this hampers strength gain and explosiveness, and this guideline is very evident in Carl Snyder's training as well. Based on the available footage, he appears to stay around that area all the time. And I totally understand where this rationale is coming from. He wants to prove the point of wrestlers performing too much volume and just adding a bunch of fatigue and soreness, especially now that they have wrestling to prepare for as well. But by saying that anything above one or two repetitions is not conducted to strength and power is an oversimplification. Now you can definitely improve in strength and power by sticking to one or two reps, but it is far from the only solutions, there are other means as well. Athletes are simply too different and there are many factors that decide what works for one athlete and the other, and there are infinite ways of constructing a program, and your body needs variation in some form, which we're gonna go into later. But again, the principle I believe he wants to convey is quality over quantity. And here is a very interesting statement about Snyder's training. This may or may not be an exaggeration, but he's saying that excluding warm-up sets, Snyder usually sticks to around 9 repetitions in one 4-week cycle on the squats. Meaning on average, he performs around 2 or 3 repetitions on the squats during the working sets per week. And very evidently it is working perfectly fine for him, if we observe his development over time. And I actually believe this. Now of course I would imagine that the warm-up sets leading up to those will be quite heavy as well, so working sets versus warm-up set is up to debate. But one advantage of a format like this is exactly what it says. You save tons of time and you perform quality work. As a competitive wrestler you have your own sport to train for and truth be told you do not need to spend 3 hours in the gym every day and if you're doing that you probably shouldn't, you're not prioritizing your time correctly. And if you think you will have some sort of secret advantage over your opponents due to doing this, you're out of your mind. One hour of strength and conditioning that is designed appropriately with quality stuff will do you wonders. A 5 minute warm up with 55 minutes of solid lifting will take you a long way. You will get a long way with a few quality repetitions on the basic compound lifts, the battle tested and time proven, classic bench presses and deadlifts and power cleans and things of this nature. On this aspect I totally agree with Mr. Serafinas. 
and arguably an advantage of sticking to few intense reps in the lifting room as opposed to 5x5s or 3x10s and things of that nature is that it will likely leave you fresher for the resting sessions as well. Generally speaking, intensity is less taxing than volume. Of course, there's tons of factors involved, but many experienced lifters can relate to this. Adding on the previous point, he's saying that intensity and volume are carefully chosen to prevent soreness, and he adds that this is an intuitive process and it cannot be learned by theory alone. And yes, I have to agree to this, and it is to a very large part correct. Strength training involves volatile and emotional humans, and humans are different. To a large extent, choosing the correct progressions for athletes is intuitive, especially now that they are training for two sports, for example strength training and wrestling. To a certain extent we are programming for two sports, and the wrestling itself, the fatigue it brings in is a whole multitude of variables, and determining the progressions is not easy, you need thousands of hours of practice to know what is appropriate for the next day or the next week or the next month. You will not find one world-class strength coach that read themselves to becoming one. It stems from both theoretical practice as well as a humongous amount of observing and coaching in the field, live experience that is. And here he's mentioning the muscle fibers of the body, slow twitch and fast twitch, and how the fast twitch muscle fibers are responsible for the powerful activities that we perform. And again he is arguing that anything above 2 reps or so is not conductive to explosive power development in that it doesn't recruit the fast switch muscle fibers. But the reality is though that if you want to recruit those fast switch muscle fibers it is not so much about the external weight per se but about the intensity that you are able to put forth, the mental intention that is. This is known as motor unit recruitment and rate coding. You can achieve a high degree of motor unit recruitment from a set of 5 at say 70% of 1 repetition maximum as a set of 3 at say 80% of 1 repetition maximum. However, one advantage with heavier weights for fewer repetitions, say 1 to 2, is that arguably it is easier to force yourself to recruit those motor units because you have incentive to. It just happens to be so that when you're moving heavy weights, you are forced to put forth high effort as opposed to lighter weights. Regardless of what format you choose though, in strength training, one way will not work forever. At some point you have to introduce some form of variation to break plateaus, because you will reach plateaus. And high repetitions are just one of many variations you can introduce. It depends on the athlete and their circumstances. Variation basically explains the point that the body accommodates and adapts, and it needs change to keep adapting. A very traditional way as we went through is to change the repetition range. For example, you have been performing high reps for a while, okay, change to low repetitions or vice versa. But given that Snyder and his coach stick to a maximum of 1-2 to two repetitions basically all the time, how do they implement this variation? It appears that they do this in the form of partial repetitions, that is by strengthening the body with exercises at specific sticking points. And I assume that they stick to those formats for a while and then return to full range of motion strength training again. And I am sure that there are many more solutions that they implement, but this is only based on the available footage that I have seen. When it comes to variation, there are infinite ways of implementing this. You can change the reps, you can change the range of motion, you can switch exercises in the same category, you can add sets or deduct sets or vary the rest periods, you can change your environment altogether, it is never ending. Here we can see some elevated deadlifts that he performs, here's a set of 1 at 660 pounds, which is about 300 kilograms. And here is one at 545 pounds at a slightly lower position, and you can also see a slight shrug at the end, which actually makes it kind of like a clean pull rather than a deadlift, which really solidifies the thrower background of his coach, because throwers, track and field throwers, they perform a lot of clean pulls. And this basically trains the triple extension of your body, you know, this total body twitch, which is very applicable to wrestling takedowns and defensive maneuvers. Here he's performing a dead stop bench press from 5 inches at 405 pounds, which is about 183 kilograms. Trust me, this is not easy to do, performing a bench press from a dead stop that is, and those are very impressive numbers. He also performs partial repetition bench presses with the help of blocks as you can see here, here's a set of 1 at 405 pounds again. And I can imagine that he performs full repetition bench presses as well, this is just a means of introducing variation and breaking plateaus. 
Now arguably dead stop bench presses will reveal your energy leaks pretty well because you don't have this initial momentum, you have to establish it and press it up and it can be good for certain wrestling situations like escapes from parterre position, you know, you're pressing your opponent up to create space and scenarios like this. And here he's emphasizing the point of training for athleticism, power that is. You should not train like a bodybuilder with specific splits like okay today is the leg day and here is the arm day or bicep day or forearm day. Just stick to the compound lifts you know at every movement pattern, push, pull, deadlift and squat, a few quality reps, a few quality sets, exert yourself maximally on every repetition, go for speed and quite simply change things up when you plateau. That's it. And here he's discussing how higher strength makes wrestling technique more efficient. Of course, your strength will be of limited use if you don't have the wrestling fundamentals bogged down, common sense, but all else being equal, yes, the stronger wrestler will obviously have an advantage. A situation of equal positioning in wrestling, a 50-50 scenario if you will, the stronger wrestler will obviously have the advantage. In this post he is arguing as to why Snyder performs dead stop or partial squat status and we can see Snyder does a lot of those. This is known as the Anderson squat. And his coach is saying that this is the best and safest option out there. He states that he can immediately tell if an athlete has bad squatting technique through this variation. Now saying that it is the best squatting technique, I don't know, it sounds a bit anecdotal, I don't know how you quantify that, I can't either prove it or disprove it. But saying that it is a safe option that reveals the athlete's energy leaks might be more plausible. In the Anderson squat due to performing in the lift at the dead stop, you will have to take things such as core tension more seriously because there will be this initial momentum phase that you have to break through in order to stand up with the weight of course. And arguably as we went through earlier this is a suitable alternative actually for wrestling because you will often lift your opponents from a dead stop position rather than a dynamic position as in the eccentric phase of a squat. That being said I would recommend performing this as a supplement to standard squat rather than replacing them all together and I can guess that Snyder probably does this as well but I am not certain. Here he's performing a barbell lunge for 1 plus 1, 1 on each side that is for 415 pounds, 188 kilograms. And this is a unilateral squat variation. The rationale is that in wrestling, sometimes you perform maneuvers on one side of the body at a time rather than an equal positioning as evident in a standard back squat, which is bilateral that is, so you need to work on this aspect also, which Snyder is doing here. Here is performing a hip thrust, 655 pounds, which is roughly 300 kilograms for one repetition. Yeah, you can basically see in most exercises he sticks to one or two repetitions, no more than that, exactly as his coach says. And why the hip thrust? Well, think of defending a takedown, you extend your hips, right? Or think of going for a deep double leg, you extend your hips again. Hip strength is very important in wrestling. Almost every offensive and defensive maneuver involves some form of extension of the hips. Here is one repetition on the dips at 205 pounds or 93 kilograms. He does full range of motion, looks very good, very strong. And the dips, they basically work on your pressing strength. It is really, as his coach says, one or two reps in everything. Here is performing a one repetition bicep curl at 156 pounds. Now believe it or not, the bicep curl is not just for aesthetics. The arms are heavily involved in wrestling and especially the biceps and you need strength in this department as well. Think of hand fighting, think of going for an underhook or pummeling and things of this nature. Here is performing a seated strict overhead press at 275 pounds or 125 kilograms, partial repetition that is. And here is a standard full range repetition, one repetition at 225 pounds which is about 100 kilograms. And yes, this basically works on the pressing strength in a vertical manner. Here we have the push press, one repetition at 325 pounds. The push press is different from the overhead press that we went through in that you can use your leg drive so it becomes a triple extension as well, total body power development. And then you transfer all of that momentum into your upper body which does the pressing again in a vertical manner. So this could be more thought of as an explosive power exercise for the lack of a better term. And of course the king of wrestling pulling strength, back strength the pull-ups or the chin-ups here that he's performing more specifically because the palms are facing inwards. Those are some weighted variation, I can't tell what they are but it looks heavy, it's two repetitions here as well. That's it for this video, thank you for watching, I hope you learned something new. 
If you're interested in getting coached by me, just visit my website. I work with elite athletes from all over the world and I also sell programs for different sports. Thank you for watching.